Well, good morning, church. How are you? Good to see you. Let's prepare ourselves for worship today. Why don't you stand with us? And I want to read a scripture. So there's this phrase that turned around in my head the other day. Um, foreigners here in reverent fear. And I was like, oh, where did that come from? And I was just talking to Larry about it. And it's from 1 Peter. Because you ever feel like you don't belong? You ever feel like this just feels uncomfortable? You ever feel like this doesn't feel like home? This place, it's not. It's okay. You can feel that way. In 1 Peter it says, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. In reverent fear. Fear of God. Not fear of the world, not fear of man, not fear of things, not fear of coronaviruses, not fear of um, any of that stuff. Fear, holy fear and respect and love of God. So think about that. Close your eyes. Think about just we don't belong here and that's okay. We're here to lift God up and serve him in reverent fear. search the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty praise the treasures that fade are never enough and you came along you put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing Lift him up. better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Well, oh, there's nothing. Better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. 
have you. There truly is nothing better than you. Lord, I pray that you will feel praise today as we stand and we sing these songs and we join our hearts to these words. Lord, as this next song talks about, bind our hearts to you. We have a habit of wandering away and not really realizing that we're wandering away, Lord. So bring us back to you, Lord. Always bring us back to you. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of God's unchanging love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, 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 oh. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, oh, oh. To grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a better, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Oh, 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 here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Oh, 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 oh. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount i'm fixed upon it mount of god's unchanging love oh oh, oh I'm fixed upon it, mount of God's unchanging love. Oh, 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 oh. When 
and I am sinking down When I am lost at sea No solace to be found No ground beneath my feet I turn to you as I go down I reach for you through roaring waves My only hope is in your arms My only prayer is that you save me Cause you make me so like the angels You let me walk my strength when all is gone when I am all alone no land is in my sight all others lost from view and comes the darkening night I reach for you as I go down I look to you through roaring waves My only hope is in your arms My only prayer is that you'd save me Cause you make me so strength when all is gone Cause you make me so like the angels you let me walk on the water you let me run with white horses Jesus my strength when all is My strength when all is gone. You are my strength when all is gone. You are my strength when all is gone. Father, thank you for being our strength. Thank you for making us strangers here. We pray that we remember that you are preparing a place for us, that we have your hope to look forward to every day and for eternity. Father, we lift you up. We give you all the praise and the glory. Amen. Amen. All right. So John chapter 14, and uh, we're going to look at verses 1 to 7. And uh, before we uh, read that, I just kind of want to open up by briefly bringing attention to the fact that Christians uh, today and in the past uh, all over the world have been under fire for their faith. Um, Even in the United States of America, uh, Christians are being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Many Christians in the U.S. aren't being persecuted because they call themselves Christians per se, but because of their Christian practice, um, because of their Christian testimony or their lifestyle as a Christian, as it plays out and they make decisions or they say yay or nay, yes or no to this or that, or I will do this or I won't do that, as a Christian they have those convictions and because of those convictions, played out in their lives, they are persecuted for that. Um, If you witness Christ in your life, through your life, somebody is not going to like that. Uh, 
if you stand against unrighteousness and what the Bible says is sin, then someone will certainly not like that. Um, a few examples, in February of 2010, uh, there were two street preachers that were shot and killed in Florida. Uh, these two young men, age 24 and 23, were shot and killed in Boynton Beach, Florida, where they evangelized after meeting 18-year-old Jariah Woody, local police say. They witnessed to Jariah Woody for 15 minutes until he got a phone call and he told the preachers that he, he had to go. And as they walked away, Woody suddenly started walking back toward them. One of the street preachers walked up to greet him again and was killed with a shotgun blast at point-blank range. When the other gentleman ran, he was shot in the back. And after he fell down, Woody shot him in the head, execution style, with a shotgun. How many of you guys heard about that? Not only are we being persecuted, but it's not being talked about much, is it? It's not being reported on very much, is it? Not only are Christians being shot in the streets, but they're being gunned down inside of their churches. Just back in March of 2009, Pastor Fred Winters was murdered while preaching in his pulpit in Maryville, Illinois. In September... A pastor and associate pastor were both shot in a Lakeland, Florida church. I think in 2019, I believe it was, Jim Polian was killed while holding a pro-life sign in front of his granddaughter's Owasso, Michigan high school. In the public school system, across this nation, teachers are being fired for expressing their personal beliefs on their personal Facebook page. In one case, gay right activists are calling for a Christian teacher to be expelled from her job after she described homosexuality as a sin on her Facebook page. The U.S. Supreme Court recently heard oral arguments on October the 5th in a case that could have serious impact on what the definition of a minister is and who has defining rights. You see, the deeper issue in the case is whether the federal government should have the authority to decide for faith-based institutions what defines a minister and who can be hired or fired. In April of 2009, the U.S. House approved a federal hate crime hate crimes bill that would provide special protections to homosexuals that would believe that they would like to live that lifestyle, but then it leaves Christian ministers open to prosecution if their teachings were linked to any subsequent offense by anyone against a gay person. I've told the church often in a joking way many years ago, and it seems to be something that is probably a little more uh, true today, but in our budget meetings, maybe we need to put a line item in there that says, get pastor out of jail <laughs> expense. There was a Christian couple from Orange County, California. They were fined in September for holding Bible studies inside of their own home for what city officials called a regular gathering of more than three people in their homes. Now, this is what the city said. The couple violated a municipal code that prohibits religious, fraternal, or nonprofit organizations in residential neighborhoods without a conditional use permit. This is America. <laughs> I'm reminded when I hear these things, I read these, these events that are going on, and, and I think, you know, that, yeah, America, you know, other countries, it's still a lot worse, but I've said many times, what makes us different? I'm reminded, however, of what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 1-7, 
This was before he was crucified. This was before he rose from the dead. They were living under Roman rule. You can imagine the disciples' troubled hearts. You could imagine the feelings of confusion, the doubt, the fear in their lives, the fear for their lives as his disciples and, and his followers when Jesus tells them that he is going to leave. He's leaving them. That he was, he's going to die. He's going to, uh, I mean, he, he tried to explain what was going to happen. They didn't always understand everything he taught them. But you can imagine the fear that they had, and so he shares this with him in John 14, 1 to 7. This is what he says, and, and I think this is what Jesus is telling us even today as Christians, as his followers. He says this, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And whither I go you know, and the way you know. And Thomas says unto the Lord, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. We don't know where you're going, he says, and, and we know not the way. And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your heart, that is, don't let your thoughts and your feelings, don't let those things be troubled. So let me just stop and ask you guys, how have the last 12 months been going for you? Have you had a troubled heart at all? Have you been concerned about what's been going on around us? I would think it's probably safe to say that there have been uh, some troubled hearts over the past 12 months for a lot of different reasons. Um, I wonder if Jesus was troubled when he was, um, you know, with what he saw going on in the temple, when he saw livestock being sold and people being swindled by the money changers and charging them way more than they should have charged for the animals for sacrifice and, and the way that they would trade for different things back then, was he troubled when he saw injustice, when he saw a woman caught in adultery and she was being threatened by a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites? Do you think Jesus had a troubled heart or was bothered by the fact when, when he sat down and he actually ate bread with the one who was soon going to betray him? As soon, I mean, the, his heart was troubled, it says, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember that? And he was so troubled by what was soon to happen to him, the Bible says that he was sweating drops of blood. It's an actual medical condition. You can read about it. So what is Jesus saying in John 14? I would submit to you today that in spite of the things going on, in spite of the, the things that we deal with in life and, and maybe the pain that you're going through or maybe the setbacks or the difficulties that come with being a Christian in a world that is increasingly hostile towards our faith, we have still more reasons to not be troubled than we do to be troubled. That doesn't mean we put our heads in the sand and not notice what's going on. I think most Christians are realists. But I would say this. I would say, number one, we should not be troubled by our troubles because we believe in God. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul, he wrote, he, he basically said, we're not a people without hope, are we? I mean, amen? Amen. We still have hope, right? Even though things maybe don't look the way we want them to be, we still have hope. We can be grieved about what we see happening in the world around us. We can be even disappointed by the changes that we see happening in our country. But these things should not overwhelm the Christian, the follower of God, the one who believes in God, because we as Christians 
believe in an all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God who is absolutely still in charge of everything. And we need to trust that he's allowing certain things in order to accomplish his sovereign plan. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of what Daniel said in chapter 2, verse 21 of Daniel, when he said, And he changeth the times and the seasons, he removeth kings, and he setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. We are not like unbelievers that have no hope. That is not what Christians should be living like. That's not who we are. That's not the kind of people that God wants us to be. We believe in God who raises up leaders and he can remove leaders. Nothing, absolutely nothing is beyond his strength and his power. And I'm sure that some of you, like Bianca and I, we've talked, we've wondered, and maybe even felt troubled about you know, your children or your, maybe your future grandchildren growing up in a world that's not like it used to be. You know, and, and you worry about what it's going to be like for them to grow up in, in a world that we see going one direction, but we can be reminded by something. You know what's so interesting is when, because we've had this talk before, and I, I've, been, I've been troubled about that. I, I've often wondered, I, sometimes I've even said to myself, God, thank you for not giving me another one. Because they're going to grow up. I don't, I don't know that I want them to grow up. And, and you know what? That's, that's the wrong way of looking at it. That's the wrong way of thinking. Uh, you know, I've, I'm reminded of what Mordecai told his niece Esther when, when uh, she became, uh, she was made queen of Persia. You see, in, in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, Mordecai asks his niece, um, who is now queen, he asks her this, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then, sh then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now you say, what does that mean? In other words, God knew all of that was going to happen. He knew all of it was going to happen. And you know what he did? He placed Esther right where she was, right when she was, because he was going to use her to make a difference in that nation. You see, what was true of Esther, parents, it's also true for us today, for our kids. We shouldn't be troubled for our children because the world that they're going to grow up in isn't what it used to be. God created them for such a time that he created them. Their life wasn't a coincidence. Your life wasn't a coincidence. You, you know, we as adults, we look back, and, and I know my grandparents, they look back and they say, I cannot believe the way things are today. You know, we're doing the same thing, aren't we? We're looking back and saying, I can't believe things are, are where they are today. You know how long that's been going on? <laughs> it's been going on for a while, hasn't it? Our lives are no coincidence. Our children's lives are no accident. Our responsibility as parents is actually to raise them, raise them up to know God's power. Raise them up, teaching them about the authority of God's word. Teaching them to walk in faith, knowing that God is in control. That's how you can walk in faith. Don't teach them to be fearful and disheartened by uh, you know, where the world is at, you know, but, but hopefully teach them that they can do something about it. You know, every single person in all of history has been placed in the time that they were put in, and it's because of God's sovereign plan. Listen, he knew that Daniel could handle the lion's den. He knew that David could handle the lion and the bear and then ultimately Goliath. And listen, Goliath had brothers. He had relatives. He had to deal with them as well. God knew all of those things. God knew that Esther could handle <clears throat> uh, Haman. He knew that Peter was going to be able to handle persecution. He knows that your child and your children and your grandchildren will be able to handle whatever challenge they face in life. He has created them for such a time. So we shouldn't be afraid for our children, but instead be honored. Be honored that God chose you to raise that child in one of the most difficult times in our nation's history. I say, rise to the challenge. 
raise up Daniels, raise up Davids, raise up Esthers and Peters. God is not scratching his head going, man, I didn't realize this was going to happen. It never occurred to him. Listen, we cannot let our fear as parents darken the plan that God has placed on our children and our grandchildren. I know it's hard to imagine our kids as anything other than those little babies we used to carry around and feed and change their diapers. But they were born for such a time as this. We shouldn't be troubled by our troubles because we believe in God, but also because we believe in Jesus. If you notice there, he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. You know, the disciples had been with Jesus for, what, a little over three years by this time. Guys, I want you to think about what they saw, what they witnessed as disciples. Imagine walking and talking with Jesus, being taught by him, and witnessing all of the miracles he, that he performed. Imagine what that would do. Imagine, just for a moment, they saw him do the most amazing things. I mean, it just kind of would blow your mind to see it going on today. If you were to see some of the things he did, they had seen him cast out demons. They saw him walk on water. And what did Peter do? He got out of the boat and took a step, didn't he? We like to point out the fact that he lost faith. I like to point out the fact that I'd have been like, one step, you got to be kidding me. A step on water would be pretty impressive, you know, in my opinion. They had seen him do these things. They saw him heal the sick, stop storms. They saw his power. They saw that. They witnessed it firsthand. You see, they had been with him when he healed the woman who, remember the woman who touched the hem of his garment? Remember that? And she was healed. And they, had, they were with him when, when he told them to let the children come to him. And, and when he had saved the, the life of the woman's daughter that, um, that, uh, you know, that, and saw how he dealt with the woman at the well. And, and you know, she had been married for four, you know, by four different times. And then she was living with another, another man. They, they saw how he treated her. They, they saw him feed thousands of people on more than one occasion. Um, I mean... I mean, guys, listen, they saw his power. They saw his compassion. They saw him heal the daughter of the synagogue leader after, after people said that she was dead. And they saw him delay on purpose several days before he went and raised Lazarus from the dead. He knew that he could heal Lazarus. They had never seen that raise someone from the dead. They'd seen him heal people. So he was going to show him something, show them something else about himself they'd never seen, right? So he waits on purpose, then he goes, and they say, oh, you know, you should have been here, and he wouldn't have died. And basically he tells them, you've seen me heal, but I'm going to show you real power now. You know, the lesson in that also is his timing. You see, they, they saw God's timing. They saw Jesus' timing. You know, in the previous chapter, Jesus washes their feet. They had seen him grieve over the city of Jerusalem. They, they didn't want, Peter didn't want to, but, you know, he washed his feet. Jesus washed his feet anyways, and um, they had seen him weep at the grave of Lazarus. They saw Jesus' love. They saw power, compassion, timing, love. They saw all these things. Now Jesus tells them, you've seen all of these things, you guys. going to be leaving trust me you may not and this might be how we feel today we may not understand what's going on and what's going to happen in the days ahead we might not understand why things are going the way they are we might not understand why maybe why you know jesus had to die they didn't understand that maybe we don't understand why a loved one uh, passes away But he just simply says, you need to trust me, because none of this is a surprise to me. Nothing in the days ahead beyond his ability was beyond his ability to deal with, and it still isn't. All of this was planned before the foundation of the world. So he says, believe, he says, believe in God, believe also in me. 
how much more should we then believe and trust? Considering the fact that we are on this side, the other side is the resurrection. I mean, they probably thought the world was going to end. We know he was crucified, but we also know he rose from the dead. Now somebody, you know, um, you know, when we know, we, we know he was crucified, we also know he was raised, we know that the devil, we also know that he tried to destroy him. When Jesus beat death and hell and the grave, we know that the devil did everything he could to stop the church at the time. And guess what's happening? It's still going on. It's been going on since the beginning of the church. But, you know, back then what happened is the fields were watered with the blood of martyrs and every single place that, that Christians were forced to scatter, guess what happened? The gospel was spread. They just took it with them. So guess what? The devil didn't win that one either. More churches were started, started during that time than any other time because they were scattered. We know the devil used Saul. We, Saul, his name meant destroyer at the time. Imagine that. The Apostle Paul, his name was Saul. The devil used Saul before to attack and kill Christians, to put them in prison. And then Jesus met this guy on the road to Damascus, and he asks him, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he turned that Christian persecutor into a Christian preacher who has written many of the books of the New Testament. My friends, nations rise and nations fall. Buildings are built, they're torn down and replaced. Churches are planted, only to maybe lose their fire one day and be replaced by another. Congregations, individual congregations gather together, they worship, they serve the Lord, only to later on maybe sometimes disperse and be replaced by others. And guess what else? Political parties. They start, and then they're replaced. They change. They might even have the same name, but they're not the same. And yet through it all, there is one thing that remains true. And my friends, that is that God is still on the throne. And someday our Savior is going to return. And you know what's going to happen on that day? You and I aren't going to be thinking about who was elected as a president or elected official or representative. I don't call them leaders anymore. They're representatives of the people. They're not our leaders. They are our representatives. You're not going to be worried about who they are. You're not, when Jesus returns, you're not going to be thinking about court judges on that day, you're going to be thinking about the name that is above every name. That's who you're going to be thinking about. A matter of fact, on that day, angels in heaven, they are going to be proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And on that day, every single Republican knee is going to bow. Every Democrat knee is going to bow. Every single independent knee is going to bow. I don't care if you are a communist or a socialist. Every single knee will bow before the name of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Go ahead, deny it today. <laughs> it's not going to change when he returns. Don't confess it today. You're going to be forced to confess it later on. Believe in God, believe also in me. Most Christians, again, as I said, they're realists. We don't, we don't deny that there are troubles in the world. We know that there's troubles in the world. We know we, we experience pain and suffering. We have tears and heartache in the world. But listen, we shouldn't be overwhelmed by that. We shouldn't be overwhelmed by it. We shouldn't allow our hearts to be weighed down and troubled by the troubles because, again, we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, but also... We shouldn't be troubled by our troubles because there is more. There's more to life than this. There's more to life than what we experience every day. There's, there's more than just life. There's eternal life. 
And I think, you know, if we're not careful, what happens is sometimes, I mean, listen, you got to admit, what's the first thing most of us are doing in the morning when we wake up? How many of you guys are checking out the news station or a channel or some type of a political feed or, or uh, I mean, uh, come on, let's be honest. What are we, we're trying to figure out what's going on in the world around us, right? What's the new news? That's what most of us are doing, I think. I think sometimes we can spend too much time worrying over what is going on in the world, and especially in our own country. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be aware and, and, and be educated and, 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 you know, have a voice. Listen, our Constitution still allows us to do that. We hope we can keep that. But sometimes we can spend too much time worrying about it, worrying about what's going on. You know, I, again, like you, I am grieved over what I see taking place. But my friends, again, nations rise, nations fall. And uh, you know what King Solomon uh, reminds us in Ecclesiastes? He reminds us that all is vanity. All is vanity. It's all futility. We serve and we vote as Christian citizens in our country. But even this place, even what we are doing is temporary. The Bible tells us that one day there will be a new heaven, there will be a new earth, and that everything we are building, everything that we have worked so hard on and worried about so much one day, it'll be no more. You're not really going to want it anyway when you see the new heaven and new earth. That's what you're going to be enjoying. But praise God that Jesus is preparing a place for us. Amen? I mean, honestly, there's a place prepared for us called heaven. I want you to notice, Jesus says that he is preparing a place, okay? Heaven's not a state of mind. Um, it, it's not this, like, you know, cosmic spiritual condition that somebody might have. It is a real place. He went there. He says, I'm preparing a place for you. Notice also he says that there are many mansions, right? Many mansions. He is preparing each of those places for you and for me individually, that way, maybe when I go to sleep and snore at night, I won't bug my wife. I don't know. She needs an entire mansion away for her, you know, not to be able to hear me. Now, some translations talk about it as rooms. It's going to feel like a mansion, I'm sure. Well, listen, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know everything. I know that he is preparing a room. He's getting a room ready for every one of us. He's getting a place ready for every one of us. And I don't know everything that's going to be in that place. And I don't know everything that, that we're going to do there. But I do know, I, I know a lot of things that aren't going to be there. Uh, there won't be any rioting in heaven. Amen. There's not going to be any lockdowns in heaven. Amen. There will have, my goodness, you guys, you guys good with lockdowns? I guess you are. <laughs> There'll be no pain. There will be no suffering. You know, after the beginning, there's going to be no more tears in heaven. The Bible tells us that Jesus himself is going to wipe away every tear in heaven. We will never again have to say goodbye. In heaven, we will find our Christian loved ones. We are going to find our believing friends and family. There will be the greatest reunion. Nothing on this earth can even compare. Man, I look forward to that. I cannot wait to see my mom and my grandfather, my Uncle Jerry. I can't wait to see my Uncle Buford. I can't wait to see Grandpa Delmar. I, I cannot wait to see Mark Newman, who, is, who, who led me to the Lord. But you know who else you get to see? You get to see the Apostle Paul. You get to see Daniel. You get to talk to Esther, King David. But most of all, you get to meet Jesus face to face. And there will be nothing, there is nothing like it. Absolutely nothing like it. You know, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. And he's actually preparing a place for us. And he says, if I am going to prepare a place for you, I will 
come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is a promise from Jesus. Now, I'll admit there are times when I'd like to just take my family and go hide out somewhere in the middle of nowhere and tell the world to go away and leave us alone and go pretend I'm on that show alone. Uh, you, ever, you ever feel like that, just, just wanting to just get away? Anybody ever feel like that? But the Lord has not called us to be these uh, Christian hermits living only for ourselves. He's called us to be his ambassadors. God has called us to represent him. He's called us to go into all the world making disciples of every nation, regardless of the state of the nation, whether it's good or bad. We don't, guys, we don't have time to sit down and wallow around in our troubles and our worries. We have work to do. And uh, Jesus is coming again. And I'll tell you today, his return has never been closer. And tomorrow, it's going to be a day closer. It is tomorrow, can't you see it? To our Christian brothers and sisters before us, you know, when I think of what they've done, I just, when I think of what's going on today, what I see and what I read and things that we've read about in history, they gave their lives so that you and I could be saved, that the gospel could be preached to us, that the gospel would reach this country. They gave of themselves. We come from believers who, uh, they were burned at the stake for their beliefs. They were crucified on crosses for their beliefs. We, we come from uh, Christians who, uh, you know, have, have died for their faith so that the Bible could be put in a language that we can understand. We come from believers who have, they traveled marshy swamp lands and winter uh, seasons, a harsh winter uh, places, unknown parts of the world in order to carry the gospel to people who have never heard it before. And I am grateful for them and for their sacrifices and that because of them, you and I, we're here today. We're in this place today so that you and I might be saved. We might be able to hear the gospel, but we have a responsibility, don't we? We have a responsibility to those who have not yet heard. Can you believe that there are people in America that have never heard the name Jesus? There once was not a time like that. That time is, is done and over with. There are people in this country who have never heard the name Jesus. And if they are hearing the name, there's a better chance that it's being put in a negative light than a positive light. As Christians, we cannot wait for the world to tell them about Jesus. We can't rely on them to do it for us. It's our responsibility. We need to stand for Christ, no doubt about it. We need to stand for what is right. There is no doubt about that. You should make your voice heard. You have a right in this country. The government allows us as Christians to make our voice known and heard. No doubt we should be sharing the good news. And so he says, don't let your heart be troubled. No matter what condition you're living in, no matter what's going on, you don't need to be troubled. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus. God's in control. Jesus loved us and died for us. He came to this place for all of us, and he's preparing a place for us. Don't let your hearts be troubled, no matter what is going on, even if you experience persecution. We should actually expect it. We should expect it and know that Jesus is there as he was for his disciples. If you remember, he said, if I don't leave, then I won't be able to send the comforter. And so Jesus left and he sent the Holy Spirit. And my friends, the Holy Spirit lives as the Son of the believing God. Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Let's you bow with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we come to you as we often do as we gather together today to read your word. And Father, we are reminded 
We are reminded of those who have come before us and they have lived their lives for you. They have even sacrificed their lives for you and for the sake of your purpose and plan to reach people like us. And Father, I thank you. We thank you for that. But Father, today I I hope and pray that that you would just impress it upon each and every one of us here that no matter what is going on, that we would just acknowledge you're in control, that you're still on the throne. Help us, Father. Show us that. Comfort us in that. We believe in you. We believe in your son, Jesus. And we ask today, Father, that you would just strengthen our hearts that you would remind us of the times in our lives in the past that you have brought us through. And we can look back like David did and we can say, you know what? Goliath's not going to be a problem. And the reason why is because you delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. So guess what? I know that you can do this with Goliath. You'll deliver me from anything. And maybe you're here today and you say, you know, yeah, there's things in my past God has brought me through. And now you're faced with a new thing, a new challenge. Just understand and know, trust in the Lord that he is there. And that he's brought you through before. He can do it again. He's brought our country through things before. And he can do that again. And so, Father, we trust in you today. We believe in you. We believe in your son. We look forward to the day when we will be with you as we enjoy the place that you're preparing for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to stand with us today. We're going to close with a song. And if you feel the need to come and pray, I encourage you to do that. Um, and uh, If you need someone to pray with you, you can grab one of us here. I'll be up at the front. But uh, we encourage you to come and pray if you need to. And uh, God bless you guys. Let's worship the Lord. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. is over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. 
that death and giving us new life, new hope in you. We lift you up. Amen. Have a blessed week.